Good morning. I welcome you to Bethlehem United Methodist Church. We ask that you please sign the attendance folders found at the end of your pew and pass it on to the person next to you. As a reminder, we have a nursery for children up to age three. Children age four through first grade are invited to attend our kids' corner, which is our children's church following the children's time. We ask that you please refer to your bulletin for the announcements. However, I would like to bring your attention to a few items at this time. First of all, um, it appears that someone has misplaced spring. If located, please return promptly to southwestern Virginia. We invite you to join us this afternoon at 2 p.m. at Runkin Pratt for a worship service with the residents there. Help is needed. Um, see Pastor Heather if you are interested in helping out. Also, um, there will be an open house for Lake Christian Ministries. Um, it is scheduled for Tuesday, May the 5th, and there is an insert in your bulletin uh, with additional information. And now, let us stand for the choral call to worship, which is found in your bulletin. together in the opening prayer found in your bulletin. Touch us, tender God, with the holiness of this morning. Let your fragrant oil of blessing pour over us and be felt as inward peace and a divine call. Bring forth in us confidence to speak your word, awareness to recognize your blessing, and courage to build your kingdom of peace. Lay your hands gently upon us, and strengthen us to do your will and sing your praises. Amen. Now let us show signs of Christ's peace to each other.
are able and join me in our affirmation of faith found on page 887 of your hymnal. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. In all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. In Christ Jesus our Lord, thanks be to God. Amen. children come forward for the children's moment. today okay so Lucy and Tyler <laughs> can I have you come stand right here and you guys are gonna be a set of seeds so you stand here Anson do you want to come stand here with Emma Grace maybe not <laughs> Emma Grace and James do you want to stand right here and you're gonna be a set of seeds yeah you're gonna be a set of seeds too Peyton Abby can you stand right here and then Wyatt can you stand right here and we're going to act this out. And then adults, just go stand behind a set of children, and I'll explain to you. Okay. So we're going to act this out. You guys are seeds, seeds, so listen, and I'll tell you what to do. Okay. Once there was a farmer, and the farmer had a bunch of seeds, and the farmer scattered the seeds all over. The first seeds, these seeds named Lucy and Tyler, ended up on rocks. And there was a bright and shining Rebecca sun, and she shined and shined on them. And the Lucy and Tyler seeds, they got sad, and they couldn't grow, so they sat down. Next were a set of seeds that were thrown in with thorns. <laughs> <laughs> and the thorns gently came around the seeds, and the seeds. Oh. And the seeds couldn't make it, so they sat down. And then the next set of seeds, let's see, it was thorns. Oh, birds. Yeah, you were listening to the story yesterday. That's right. The next set of seeds. Okay, you can go stand with Wyatt then. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Abby is the seed that gets pecked by the birds, just gently, and then the birds eat the seed up, and then the Abby seed sits down. She didn't make it. 
But then there was the last set of seeds, and they were planted in good soil, and the good soil <laughs> had them grow, and they grew. Show me how you grow seeds. Grow with me. Wyatt, Peyton, come on, grow with me. Oh, look, and they bloomed, and they became beautiful plants. Yay, good job, guys. You guys did such a good job acting that out. Thank you, adult helpers. And good job, Peyton, for remembering. I couldn't even remember what the third thing was. <laughs> and I listened to the sermon this morning. You guys are free to go to children's corner, kids' corner. Thanks. <laughs> Well, adults, you're lucky you'll get to hear that story again. Um, but I just wanted to welcome you again to Bethlehem. If this is your first time visiting with us, I hope you find us to be a warm and welcoming congregation. And I invite you back afterwards into our narthex. We have um, a gift for you as first-time guests, guests, and we'd be happy to tell you about some of the ministries we're involved in. Um, I was asked to tell you all quickly about Spring Fling um, and kind of give you a pat on the back. Congratulations, you have raised $7,000 for spring for lit fling. That's good. But uh, Rick wanted to let me know we have 19 teams, and he really wants a much, like, rounder number. So <laughs> if you are looking for something to do, um, come out and golf, and we'd be happy to put you on a team or have you start one of your own. Um, and just contact Rick Carroll if you're interested in that. Um, before we go um, any further, I just wanted to give you all this announcement. A lot of you know my husband's a um, provisional elder, about to be ordained elder in the Methodist Church, and you have been asking me, where are we going, um, if he's gonna be moved, and he is, we are. We're moving to Lane Memorial United Methodist Church in Alta Vista, so we're moving right down the road from where we are now, and that means that I'll be able to stay with you all, so it's a good thing. And I'm happy it's announcement time because it's been really hard just to be like, yeah, I know where we're going, but I can't tell you. <laughs> so I'm glad that this weekend is finally here. Um, before we go into our choral call of prayer, I want to um, call your attention to the yellow insert inside your bulletin. You'll find names of people in our congregation and our community that we are praying for and those that are in our military and serving us. So I just ask in this upcoming week, you keep those names close to your heart and in your prayers. Let us go now to the choral call, of prayer, call to prayer. As we pray, I will end each petition with, Lord, in your mercy, if you will respond with, hear our prayer. Together, let us pray for the people of this congregation, those who are sitting next to us in a need of our prayers. Lord, we may or may not know what they are going through, or we may know it intimately, but we ask for you to hear our prayer, Lord, and that they may take comfort in knowing that they are not alone, not ever, for you are always with us. Forgive us, merciful God, for the way we have failed to love our neighbors, for the ways we have failed to love ourselves, and for the way we have failed to love you. Forgive us, we pray, and free us, so that we may joyfully follow your will for our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The concerns of this local community, we ask, Lord, that you make them known to us. We pray for our neighbors, those we see, and those we often wish we did not have to see. Because in seeing them, we recognize our privilege and our guilt and not caring for them the way we are called to. Help us, God, to be more like you in caring for our neighbors. We pray for those who serve our community, Lord, through volunteering at our children's school, the local fire department, the police station, the, library, the libraries, and area ministries. We praise you for the way you call us all to serve differently. 
We pray that our hearts and minds continue to be open to the way you are calling us to be your servants to our community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The world, its people, and its leaders, we pray for the people of Nepal. Lord, as we hear the death toll climb, we cry, how long, O Lord, how long? As we see the destruction, we join in the communal weeping, but we have faith because we know that you are present in the aftermath. You are comforting, listening, loving. You hear the cries of the needy and respond. You are God who is close to the broken. We give thanks to those who are responding to those in need, for those in our military, for the United <laughs> Methodist Committee on Relief, and many other organizations and individuals. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The Church Universal, its leaders, its members, and its mission, May we continue to all work together to participate with you through grace and the Holy Spirit to bring your kingdom forth. We pray for churches in transition, for ministers who are both leaving one community and beginning to serve another. We ask that you continue to bless the United Methodist itinerant system and be with our, church as, our churches as we go into this time of transition. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As your beloved children, God, let us pray together the prayer your loving Son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us worship God with our tithes and offerings. <clears throat>
and use them to move your kingdom forward. In your precious son's name we pray. Amen. Please join us in singing Be Thou My Vision, found on page 451 of your hymnal. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 3 through 9. I will let you know that this is not printed on the back of the bulletin. However, it will be very familiar. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. But to anyone with ears, listen. The word of God for the people of God. Right. Thanks be to God. God.
Sometimes when you hear really good music, you want to applaud. But sometimes when you hear something like this, you want to just soak it in. And so let's just bow our heads just for a moment, and let's just appreciate what we just heard. Holy, holy are you. You are our Lord God Almighty. And whatever happens today, whatever said, whatever sung, you have given us a chance to experience you. May your spirit be with us as we continue our worship, knowing just how holy and how mighty you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. And thank you, Heather, for uh, introducing my message for me. Um, I, uh, I, she and I had the same experience. I was really uh, interested because what she shared with you actually happened to me. And, and actually, I, I got to be a better part, though. You know, that was fun, but uh, I like being one of the bad guys. And uh, so <laughs> I, I wanted to be the bird or the sun, you know. Do the, but, um, but there was something about, and, and I hope you saw it, too, as she shared it with us, is that there's something about experiencing Scripture. And for me, the first time that happened to me, it was, it was a revealing moment. I mean, it was something special because uh, I hadn't thought of Scripture. It was just something people read in church. And, you know, all right, yeah, what's for lunch, you know? And, and, um, and so for once, the Scripture just came alive for me. And, and, uh, and, as, and I was a part of it. And so I got to feel what it means to be the sower and to think about what it means to be the seed. Um, and, and I have to say that in the impact, I thought a lot about what it means to be the farmer. And that's usually the way it impacts me, being the farmer, sowing the seed. In fact, I ended up naming my ministry, Sowing Seeds Ministry. And I always have to explain to Christians who aren't so active, it's S-O-W. You know, they, they want to go, S-E-W? What does that mean? I, you know, but, um, but um, uh, you know, the Sowing Seeds has got a special meaning for me. It always has, and it always will. However, last night, uh, it, it really struck me, and I ended up rewriting again the whole message because, um, because what I kept thinking about was not as much about the farmer as about the soil and, and what the soil really means. I always used to think, well, our job is to just throw the seed and let it scatter where it will. But the truth is the soil has so much more meaning than that. It was there for a purpose. Why do we have four different environments that are so different? Why, why did Jesus make such an emphasis on that? He did it for a reason, because that is an area where we come in. Well, when I first thought about it last night, see, sometimes you really have to let these things nurture. And when I first thought about it last night, I said, well, Jesus is talking about us as the church. You know, we, we create four different soils, some better than others. Folks, I have 89 churches on my district. I can name 10 or 12 churches in each one of these areas. You don't want me to name the ones in this area. But, but yours is definitely in this area. <laughs> oh, boy, am I going to get in trouble. Uh, nobody else watches that YouTube, right? Anyway. Um, but, uh, but, you know, it's, it's in that good soil. But, but what about here? You know, how can we not be that kind of church? Well... That's one way to think of it, but truthfully, I think God is thinking bigger than that. I think God is thinking of the soil as not just the church, but it's also your family. It's also your community. It's also the world. And as a church, what we're responsible for is that we have impact on that soil. So how can we as a church not have this, but work more towards this? And that's the part that, that just got me thinking and praying and trying to figure out how I could bring you a message that would help you understand the importance of what it means to have good soil. Now, it's not like I have to do this because your church has done some things that I think are remarkable. Good churches do this. And I want to give you a very specific example. Um, you have... Um, you have your council of, of ministry, uh, and, and they met with me the first week I was here. And they shared a, um, a survey that was done that basically asked, and I'm not sure how many of you saw the survey. I think all of you participated in it, or most of you, because the response to me was amazing. The survey asked three very simple questions. Number one, 
What is it that you like most about your church? Number two, if you could change anything about our church, uh, what would it be? And number three, what do you believe is God's vision for our church? They're simple, but they're profound. What impressed me, though, is that I then received a list at the uh, meeting of 156 different suggestions. And when I asked about it, she says, well, we actually narrowed that down some because there was some repetition. I'm thinking, that's amazing, 156 ideas. That's what good churches do. They think about it. Now, are you going to do every one of them? Yes, you are, and I've got a timetable set down. <laughs> Of course not. But what you're going to do is, is you're going to winnow through that, and you're going to pray about it, and you're going to let this kind of germinate like those seeds. And if it's in good soil, what will come out of that is great ideas. And these 156 suggestions were centered around they had great mission ideas, they had great ministry ideas, hospitality, great ways to improve your faith, ways to reach out to different groups. And, and I want to ask, is this important? You better believe it's important because the world, if you haven't noticed, has changed. It's changed a lot. Um, it used to be in the 50s and 60s, if you built a beautiful building like this, people would come. Is that true anymore? No. And the church, for many reasons, is declining. And, and, and we all know that. I could give you the horrible statistics of how we're doing it, but that's not what we need. What we need is some help with how to do better. Your church is one of what we call the 15%. There are 15% of our churches, believe it or not, nationally, who are strong spiritually and strong financially. You are definitely in that category. So when I make some of these suggestions, these are suggestions for a good church to do better, not a bad church that needs to be turned around somehow. And that's a, that's a compliment. But like any good church, those 156 suggestions represent possible ways to reach out in ways you haven't thought of. Because the truth is, as good as you're doing, you've not reached everybody in this community and you haven't even come close. The numbers of people who need to be in this church and receive this love of God and this grace that you've got is huge. And our task is even bigger. There are so many folks looking for that opportunity. Are they gonna come because of the building? No, and that's one thing we have to get used to. They're going to come because we ask them. There are about four different things that you kind of that I kind of look for in, in today's world in terms of how do people know. First is how do people hear about your church? Well, one, they hear about it. You know, we used to think, um, well, maybe they'll hear about it through one of our ads. Or maybe they'll hear about it because of this great program we have. And all of that is helpful. But the truth is, most people hear about your church because someone like you tells them. That's still number one. It's old-fashioned, but it's the one that works by far the best. Your enthusiasm, your excitement, your willingness to step out of your comfort zone and introduce yourself to people you don't know and talk about what you love about Jesus Christ is critical. It's a huge part of who we are. Now, the second part I've learned is uh, how do people check out what they hear? <laughs> now, this is where times have changed. Because in our day, if we were interested in a church and something had happened, then we would uh, ask somebody or attend a worship service. Not true anymore. Today, if someone is interested in your church, for example, they drive by, they see your name, somebody mentioned something, the very first thing they're going to do in this internet society is what? They're going to Google you, right? They're going to Google you, and when they Google you, what will they find? Your website. They're going to go to your website. Now, here... Here is where uh, we all need to learn. Because we need to learn to look at our website with the eyes of someone who is not in your church. Someone who's already in your church, the information's there, it's easy to see. But for someone who's not in your church, they're looking for answers. And this is where part three comes in, and this is the most critical part of all. Part three is what makes them actually come. And part three talks about from our day, they came because we used to think they're church shopping. You know, they're comparing us with the Lutheran or the Baptist or, or, or some other group. That is just not true.
true for the most part anymore. Seven to eight out of ten people, when they decide to come to this church, they're coming because something happened in their life. It could be a divorce. It could be cancer. It could be the loss of a job. It could be the loss of a relative. It, it could be any number of things. But seven to eight out of ten people who are going to come walking through that door are going to walk in not looking for friendship. See, in the old days, if you put a couple ushers and they were friendly and they handed you the bullet and then just welcomed you and greeted you, that was fine. But you understand, if they're coming in now not looking for friendship, although certainly that's helpful, in reality, they're looking for answers. Now, folks, that's a whole lot different, isn't it? Because if I'm coming in looking for answers, how is your church going to help me do that? Now, one of the things I've learned, and this just comes from experience, is that the first 15 or 20 minutes someone walks into this church are going to be the first 15 or 20 minutes where your church is either going to help them or not help them. And so the scary part of that is, is all of that is in your hands. If you'll notice, the preacher doesn't say a word until about two-thirds of the way through it. Now, that may help later. Some preachers, it may hurt later. <laughs> Who knows? But, but really, whether they come back to this church or whether they're a part of it, it's pretty much up to you. It's scary, isn't it? But it's true. Now, the fourth part is what makes them come back. I, I've been a part of a lot of churches, and, and I've been a part of very successful churches. But even very successful churches, when people came in, only about a third and a half of them actually came back. What changes that is the way you can put yourself out and look for ways to get to know these newer people that are coming in, to offer alternatives for them, to offer small groups. Now, this is where I want to talk about what, um, what happened with David and what happened with me. Um, I, you know, we joke around about David uh, taking a few days off, and I, and I got one of his emails uh, about a week ago, and he said during the first week he did nothing but sleep and eat. <laughs> what did y'all do to that boy? <laughs> he was exhausted, um, but, um, but it was good, and, and that's certainly a part of what uh, a renewal leave is supposed to do. The other part that I, I can't wait for him to come back is, is the renewal part is you're going to get a stronger, better David, <coughs> David Lord than you ever had before. <coughs> Excuse me. The reason I know that is because it happened to me. Last year, about this time, Elle and I took our renewal leave. And uh, part of it was to fulfill some bucket list things. Uh, we took an Amtrak train uh, to New York City and stayed there a few days. Uh, had a great time. Not sure I want to do it that way again, but I, you know, had a great time. Um, did some other things. Went to Epworth by the Sea and got to see where the only place where John Wesley actually came to this country. Uh, most of you, I don't know if you remember this, but he didn't do too well when he came there. But uh, but we learned a lot, <clears throat> and there's a lot of uh, mementos and stories about his visit there at Epworth by the Sea, and that's where David is going soon. So or, or has been. I can't remember, but. Um, but that was all part of it. But the main part of this for me was going to see four churches that were doing extremely well. And in the midst of those four churches, um, I picked them very carefully. They were not churches that I've ever been a part of. Uh, they weren't on our district. Uh, I deliberately picked two in Lynchburg that were not related to the Methodist Church. Um, I picked Tree of Life and Blue Ridge. Uh, each of which has about uh, 2,000 in attendance each week. And, uh, and I went there to kind of see what they're doing and learn from them. The other two were in Atlanta, Georgia. They both had had an impact on me. One was a, a Methodist church that had a huge impact on uh, both Mel and I when we were uh, going through a divorce and uh, had some insight through one of their pastors that was very helpful. The fourth one was Andy Stanley's church. Uh, near Atlanta, which has a 30,000 a week average attendance, and we were jammed into this amphitheater. They have about six or seven locations, and an amazing experience. But in each one of those, I, I learned a lot about what big churches do, and that's fine. But what I was looking for was not that. 
what I was looking for was what is that thing that they do that makes them different that any church, any church could or should be doing that they have just done very successfully. And I found it. I found it. And, and, and it kind of surprised me, got me thinking, because it went back to the sowing seeds parable, got me thinking about what it means and what it means to have these soils. Because in each one of those four churches, the main thing they were emphasizing was, we, we're glad that you're visiting our church, but we want you to know this is only a part of your total church experience. This is only kind of an introduction. This is something we do, but if you really want to know who we are and what we do, what's important is not coming here, it's what you do next. Did you hear that? It's what you do next. In each case, it might look slightly different, but it was very, very similar. I'll give you an example. When we went to Blue Ridge, I went early in the morning. I was one of the first ones in. It was a dreary morning like today. And as I pulled up, you know, I had those lights that stay on. And, and they had a, a group of about six men out there parking or helping to park cars. Gosh, I'd love to have a church. We had to have people do that. But uh, they, they, they were all praying together. And when they saw me come up, one of them immediately broke off from the group and came over to make sure that my lights were going to cut off. And once he found that out, he went ahead and walked with me on the way in, very nice gentleman, and said pretty much, I hope you love the church, hope you love this experience. He said, but you know what really changed my life was a men's group I was a part of. I mean, I was going through a rough time, and they helped me through it, and I'll forever be grateful for this group. Now, the second church I went to was uh, Tree of Life, and uh, I, I went to the Welcome Center, and the lady was very friendly, handed me some materials, and was, and was talking to me about being a visitor. And she said something that was uh, going to sound familiar. She says, we hope you like this service, but what really helped me was a divorce recovery group that I went through that helped me through a very difficult time, and I'll be forever grateful for what this church has meant for me. Now, in the third church, we went to Atlanta, and uh, we were, this was uh, uh, Andy Stanley's church, thousands of people, crowded, felt like I was in a, a, a theater uh, rather than a church, and I was just beginning to get a little frustrated, and we sat beside this couple that was kind of about our age, and uh, they started talking, and it turned out they had a daughter that was working in Northern Virginia, and you know, typical of someone that doesn't live in Virginia, our daughter works in Northern Virginia, y'all are pretty close, right? <laughs> Right. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, we had this connection, and we talked, and it turned out they actually attended both of the churches we planned to attend in Atlanta. I said, oh, we like both preachers. We go all the time. I'm thinking, okay. Um, but if you really want to know about this church, you've got to check out our small group. It's a, it's a home group that meets every week, and they have changed our lives. We, we're, we're not the same people because of them. Are you beginning to catch and, and, and the pastor, when he got up, he said, he said from the beginning, this is not going to be our typical worship. This is going to be an infomercial. And he began to talk about the importance of every single person in that room signing up for some kind of small group, mission, or some kind of next step. And then he used as an example, he put on his uh, little YouTube display, they interviewed a police officer who had just joined the church a few years ago and become a part of one of the home groups. And shortly after he joined the group, he had a routine traffic stop when the man jumped out of the car and shot him five times, almost died. He began to cry as he tried to describe what happened as he was rushed to the hospital, that the first people in that hospital to greet him was not the pastor, but it was the people in his home group. At home, the people of his home group were there immediately. And for the next two to three years, as he was going through his recovery process, that home group literally surrounded him. And he basically said with tears that I, I, I would not be here if it was not for them. Folks, this is what the people on the outside do not know. You see, most of us who, who, who are not very active in church, we think of this worship service as this is all there is. And if it's good, we'll come back. And that's okay. But we all know different. We know we're not in this church just because of this. We're in this church because there's something special here. There's, there are groups that, are, that have changed our lives. And somehow that is the message 
The people on the outside need to hear from us. When Jesus describes a farmer sowing seeds, he's not just telling a story. He's telling us what it really means to be the church. He is laying out those four different environments. And it's not just in church. It's in your family. It's in your community. It is all around you. And what he is saying is, is that where we can impact the most is, is yes, part of our job as farmers to sow seeds. I get that. So do you. But the part I didn't really get until last night was the importance of the soils. This is where we have our greatest impact. How do we make an environment where people who come in are not having shallow faith where the sun can just burn it up, or a faith that's crowded with worries and the thorns just rise up and choke them out, or a faith that's so shallow that it never gets below the surface so the birds are just there to eat them up. How do we have a faith that's nurtured in that good soil where it can grow, nurture, and reproduce? Now, Heather left a part out of her story, and that's the part I want y'all to help me with. You see, what happened when I was over here is, yes, the seed grew up, and I got to be the well, anyway. But, um, <laughs> but there's a better part. You see, the scripture says it also went 30, 60, 90 times, right? She let me have that part. Because I, that's where you come in. So I need all of y'all. See, I need to check your acting ability out. I need all of y'all to help me here because as the seed was planted and it grew and multiplied 30, 60, 90, okay, seeds, that's you. Here we go. Come on now. Let's stand up. Let's hear it. Let's see that sun. <laughs> Let's see that good seed. That's it. That's it. That's it. You got it. You got it. Praise the Lord. Sit down and let us pray. By the way, don't give up your day job. Jesus is really teaching us something special. How can we take that lesson, not just here, but out there? That's where we need the power of God's Holy Spirit. You're all wearing these bands. If you're not, you should be getting one. They're those blue bands that we passed out a couple of weeks ago. This is your opportunity to talk to people in a special way about their faith in Christ. If you didn't get one, let our ushers know. They'll be glad to give you one. If we run out, I've got more, plenty more. Don't hesitate. Give them away. Do whatever you want. But those blue bands are a great way for you to practice being the church that God wanted you to be. As we do that, may we have the power of God's Holy Spirit with us each and every day, every way. Lord, help us. Help us as we put our faith in you. Help us to know that what we do matters, not just in here, but wherever we go. As we start small groups of every kind, whether it be in divorce recovery or, or grief, or whether it be a home group, or whether it be a men's group, whether it be a work group, whether it be a mission, whatever it is. May we plant it in good soil. And may it grow. May it multiply. May it reach out to others in the way that you have called us to do and to be. As we put our faith and our trust in you, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Thank you, Larry, for that message, and I just want to extend to you all that it is never too late to come and join a Sunday school 
or a Wednesday night class. Uh, if you look in your bulletin, you'll see that not only do we have groups meeting on Wednesday night, but throughout the week. So if Wednesday doesn't work for you, um, I know what that good soil feels like, and I want all of you to have that good soil too. So think about ways in which you can get involved in our church and um, take in that good soil. So let us join together in singing our closing hymn found on page 3029 of your green hymnal um, in the desert on God's mountain. We'll sing verses 1, 3, 4, and 6. this benediction. Filled with fire of holy grounding, burning bushes may we be, drawing all to God's bright presence, beacons of divinity. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>